Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here at our first college theme presentation on the Macomb campus for this academic year. My name is Michael Maher, and I teach sociology. And part of the mission of the college theme is to help our students understand the significance, the importance of the liberal arts. Oftentimes, I will hear students say things like, I'm just here to get my gen eds out of the way. And I want to challenge you up front with that whole idea, that use of the word just. And I'm going to challenge you here today to think of your general education as being perhaps the most important part of your education. So this year's college theme is Make Good Trouble, Break the Bad Stuff. And my presentation today is titled Hammering Out Change. So when I think about this college theme, Make Good Trouble, break the bad stuff, I feel like I can break it down to one word. Change. This is what you're being challenged to do through this college theme. Now, over the years as a teacher, I've had to change a lot. Generations of students with different ideas, different ways of doing things, the integration of new technologies, the challenge of new technologies, and I know firsthand that Change is often very difficult. It's very hard to make ourselves move and let go of old ways of thinking and old ways of doing things. However, as students, you are also being challenged to change. You're being exposed to different ideas, different academic disciplines, and you're being asked to reassess what you think, what you believe. Now, the only one who, of course, can change your mind is you, but it is the job of your teachers, of your faculty members, to create an environment where you can question that. So, the purpose of college education is really twofold. And the first one of, the, of these, you already know, because you've had a lot of people talk to you about this over the years, that you're here to develop skills and competencies that will enhance your ability to, to succeed in a profession of your choosing. And that's great. That's wonderful. That is in, indeed one of the primary reasons that you are here. But you also probably don't really need me to explain that or to point that out. It is fairly self-evident. However, there is a second component to your education that oftentimes is not paid attention to, not said readily, aloud. And this is the part of your education that I want to emphasize today. And that is that you're here to acquire and expand skills and competencies that will enhance your ability to be good, responsible citizens, to be good caretakers and guardians of democracy. The uh, philosopher and educational theorist John Dewey once remarked that democracy has to be born anew each generation, and education is its midwife. So the entire purpose of your education, the entire purpose of the liberal arts education is to help prepare you to take on that responsibility. And part of that is an opportunity to explore what good trouble means and how to break the bad stuff. When you come into college, you may already have an idea about what the good stuff is and what stuff needs to be broken. But remember, I've already told you that you are going to be challenged to change your ideas, to change your thinking. So you need to also be prepared that you, in the, in the course of your education, you're make, you might change what you think of as good trouble. You might change what you think of as things that need to be broken, and that's okay. That's why you're here. So usually when we have a discussion about making good trouble, the tendency, I think, is to point out historical figures like the ones that you see in front of you right now. And these are certainly good examples of people who made good trouble. These are people who, in my discipline of sociology, I talked about in various uh, classes. Uh, you know, the, the woman at the top center here, that is Mary Harris Jones, Mother Jones, well known as a labor organizer, especially in the very early parts of the 20th century. Uh, responsible for a lot of movements that gay workers rights to organize, to end child labor laws. Uh, she was even, as I understand it, a co-founder of an organization called the Industrial Workers of the World, 
which was an attempt to essentially create one giant union of trade workers so that if one industry was having trouble getting a fair and reasonable contract, that essentially they would send out a call to all of the unions to essentially shut the system down, right? So you know, very significant to American history in terms of the kinds of labor laws that we have today. This man over here on the right may not be so familiar to you. That is a guy by the name of John Trudell. John Trudell uh, was very active in the American Indian movement in the 1970s, uh, speaker, speaking out for indigenous people's rights, trying to educate people about uh, the history of indigenous people and the contemporary consequences. Uh, he is also, I might point out, an incredible lyricist and poet. This man down here, John Lewis. The picture is of John Lewis at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, 1965, I believe, leading a march of 600 people from Selma to Montgomery to protest for voting, uh, for voting rights. Uh, you know, infamously, they walk across the bridge and they were greeted by some 150 police who then beat them, beat the protesters. Uh, I will also add, John Lewis later became a congressman in the state of Georgia and served for over 30 years, up till his death in 2020. And then, of course, there's Rosa Parks over here on your left, which is probably the most common, well-known person on the screen. You all know that in 1955, she refused to give up her seat on the, uh, on the bus to a white passenger. Um... I will also add that when that all happened, it triggered a, I think, 13-month boycott of the Montgomery bus uh, system, where citizens within that community were walking all over the pace, essentially starving the bus company of any kind of revenue in an effort to force their hand and to make change. When this all occurred, there was a 26-year-old man who had just moved to Montgomery, not very well known. The movement had actually reached out to him and asked for his assistance. He was somewhat reluctant at first, and that man was Martin Luther King Jr. Now you can see that I have titled this an alternative way to think about who is capable of making trouble. If I could flip back to the screen for just a second, there's a problem with thinking about these individuals and making good trouble. And the problem is, is that for the vast majority of us, we look at those individuals and it's very difficult to see ourselves in them, right? We look at them and we see the sort of model of per perfection. We see the final product. We're told of their victories over and over again. And it creates this perception that they just decided to do something one day and they were just particularly intelligent and smart and they figured out how to do it. And there's a problem that's contained in there because we don't hear about their failures. We don't read about those failures. We don't read and think about their flaws as individual human beings. So it's really hard to identify with that. I can't be that. So this doesn't involve me. So an alternative way to think about who is capable of making good trouble. Just think about these two images side by side. We are much more likely to pay attention or take a look at an image like this one that has Martin Luther King Jr. front and center. And we look at that and we think, well, there's someone who made good trouble, who broke some bad stuff. Thank goodness we had him. But again, it's the problem of I'm not him. I can't identify with that. So instead of focusing in on him, instead I want you to focus in on the crowd. You and I may not be able to be him, but everybody in here, has the capacity to be one of those people in the crowd. So this in part is about your ability to identify people who are making good trouble and to support those individuals. And again, we are all fully capable of this. Now at this point, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, how? Well, making good trouble or recognizing good trouble requires the skills of citizenship. But what are the skills of citizenship? Well, it just so happens that the faculty at Spoon River College have made this explicitly clear for you. Because what you are looking at is the general education competencies at Spoon River College that appear on every single syllabus for every single class that you are taking right now. 
So as you scan through these, you can see very key words, right? Communicate effectively. Use mathematical and scientific methods to solve problems. Utilizing principles of equity and to make responsible choices in a diverse world. Exercising empathy through an appreciation of arts and creativity. Using this information to make sound decisions and working collaboratively around common goals. Now, you remember the two-fold uh, sort of principles that I presented to you at the start here about the two primary reasons of, of why you're here, why you're getting a college education? This is the great part about this. These are the things that employers are looking for in a potential employee. Right? If you possess these skills, these abilities, they see that as a red flag or as a flag that says, hey, here's somebody who's trainable. You know, this is a potentially a, a very good employee. So that's one reason to care about this. The second reason is because of the second principle that I outlined. This is how we learn to be better citizens, to be responsible citizens in a democracy. So it has both of, the, both of those benefits to it. So when it comes to learning how to make good trouble, here are a couple of suggestions. Start small and doable. This, we set ourselves up for failure all the time about this. You know, we find out about an issue, we get excited about an issue, we care about an issue, and we create these expectations in our mind that we're going to do this and we're going to do that and it's going to happen next week and it's going to happen in a year from now and then we're going to solve this problem and we're going to move on to the next one. For most of us, we don't have, we're not in positions even to even make that possible. So start small and doable. Now, what does that mean? Well, maybe it means it's something as simple as someone in your family says something or tells a joke and they think the joke is funny. And you recognize that within the joke, that the joke is racist, the joke, the joke is sexist, the joke is homophobic. Now, in that moment, you have a choice to make. You can choose to make some good trouble. And when I say, in this instance, say make, make good trouble, I am not talking about having a knockdown, drag out argument or yelling at the person who just said it within your family. I'm talking about something very simple, like maybe just saying, you know, it really isn't that funny. It's actually very hurtful for this reason and for that reason. And then just simply drop it, right? Now, in that moment, you have made good trouble. That person probably will not acknowledge to you that what they said is problematic and they'll probably try to dismiss it or dismiss you. But the fact of the matter that you said something in that moment, that's making good trouble. And if you're doing it around another group of people, chances are there are other people in the group who are thinking the same thing and just and didn't have the courage to speak up. And so by speaking up and making good trouble in that moment, you make it easier for other people to make good trouble. This is how social change actually occurs, right? Little steps at a time. What matters most is the aggregate impact of many small actions by millions of people. Failures after failures after failures that ultimately lead to triumphs. That's what I'm trying to get you to identify with here. The, the crowd, not necessarily the charismatic leader. The things that we do every day. Because if history teaches us anything, I would think that it's this, that progressive social change occurs incrementally. Not with huge leaps all of the sudden. Or if you, for instance, if you think about like the abolition of slavery and you think about how many years that took in the United States, or if you think about uh, women's suffrage and you think about the decades that it took to ultimately get to that point, right? There were lots of people involved with those movements who probably felt defeated every single day, failure after failure after failure. But what I'm trying to point out to you is that we don't get to the triumph without all of those failures by those very common everyday people in their everyday lives making good trouble. Your college education is designed to challenge you, as I said, to reevaluate good trouble, as well as what stuff needs to be broken. If you, if you believe the exact same things that you believed when you started college, when you ended, you're not doing this correctly, right? You have to be open to the concept of change. And that people committed to making good trouble do not resist change. 
They instead welcome the opportunity to learn and evolve. But again, that takes courage to be able to do that. And that's the major challenge for you. So this whole, you know, hammering out change. You know, this is a, this is a phrase that's used fairly commonly, right? To hammer something out. To hammer something out is to engage in an often lengthy dialogue in an effort to find common ground and compromise. And this, of course, dovetails with my point about the fact that social change is incremental and the importance of starting small and doable. You know, think long term in terms of where you want to go or what you're trying to accomplish. But think about all of the dots between that point and where you are. And then take it one dot, one increment at a time. And in part, what that means is that you're also going to have to accept the fact that your long term goal may, in fact, not be realized in the course of your lifetime. You may have to pass the baton, if you will, to the next generation who will then pick it up and build on the progress that you and in your generation has made. But making good trouble is our shared responsibility and breaking bad stuff is our shared mission. Educating ourselves and voting, it's our civic duty. And we can do all of these things more effectively if we embrace our education and the general education competencies and we develop and refine those skills of citizenship. This is truly about empowering you as citizens. Because your education is going to enhance your ability to understand what, it, what good trouble is. So that you, can more, you have to understand what it is before you can more effectively break the bad stuff. Now, you all are very familiar with the concept of paying it forward, correct? I think that aptly applies to the point that I am trying to make here. I mean, just imagine how, yes, we've got very serious problems here in the world, in this country, but I want you to just imagine for a second how different this country would be right now if the generations prior to us had not made good trouble, had not worked to make this country better. The world that we inherited, the nation that we inherited, would look very different than it does right now. And so while we still have problems and there's still flaws, we owe them. We owe them a debt of gratitude to pick up that baton and carry it. And your education will enhance your ability to do this. There, of course, is a photo of Representative John Lewis, who towards the end of his life, I believe, famously said, never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. And that, in fact, is what led to our college theme this year, make good trouble, break the bad stuff. I would be happy to entertain any thoughts, comments, observations, anything. Yes. Yeah, I have a thought. Uh, kind of piggyback on what you were talking about, how it's kind of hard for us to be like, I can be Martin Luther King Jr., I can be Rosa Parks. Like, if they're iconic figures, it's difficult to kind of come to that level. But even them, like, when Martin Luther King Jr. was living at the height of the Civil Rights Movement before he died, I would say at least 40% of the country despised the man. Sure. Of course, today he's a revered figure. Right. right? But in his time, he had to deal with one out of two people maybe not liking him, calling him terrible names. And then you've also got his letter from a Birmingham jail where he was arrested for a protest. He went to jail, wrote that letter talking about nonviolent civil disobedience. So he had to face so many difficulties just to, you know, make his voice heard and to make that good trouble. So right. I just kind of wanted to piggyback on that. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Or just, you know, the telling of Rosa Parks' story, it's so, like... Oh, she you know, refused to give up her seats, and that's, you know, she just decided that one day. Not like she was preparing and rehearsing for most of her life for that situation, and that she was serving as secretary of the local chapter of the NAACP. And, like, that was, that was a very, uh, you know, planned, mm -hmm. you know, sort of moment, moment. And rehearsing those moments, and rehearsing those moments in our head for when they should happen, I think is really, really important. 
And yeah, and it's not like she did it. And the vast majority of people or the vast majority of white people, especially in the South, were like, oh, look at that. She, she's so courageous and such a hero. Right. No, no, that's not that's not how people reacted to that. It is only later that we recognize the, the courageousness of her actions in that moment. Thank you, Joe. Anything else? Any other thought, comment, observation? All right. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you for being here.